Hey there, it's your good buddy Joe Darlington, head of section from being James Bond. And uh, Scott and I are coming back with more content. Today we're going to talk about the films of Sean Connery. It's hard to imagine today that there was a time when people couldn't imagine anyone else besides Sean Connery playing James Bond. He was James Bond. And Sean Connery did five James Bond films originally, then he retired from the role. He was lured back to do a sixth installment and then many years later he would be lured once again to do an unofficial James Bond film uh, which we will we'll, we will technically throw into the mix uh, and we will review the seven films of Sean Connery so as of right now Scott and I have not reviewed this film so I don't have a score for it so within a little asterisk in the column number seven is never say never again I'm sure most people know the story behind this film, so I won't get into the details, but for my money, this is what you get from two men who made the film for no other reason than they had scores to settle. Broxley and co. have their bonds, we have our bonds. Kevin McClory helped Ian Fleming pen what would eventually become Thunderball, and by some legal wranglings that my small brain can't comprehend, McClory was legally able to grapple away the rights to redo Thunderball, plot, story, and all of the characters who were created by Ian Fleming. Who played the first Bond villain? Cubby hey, Broccoli. <laughs> So McClory sets out to make his Thunderball remake, and he's able to convince Sean Connery to reprise his role as James Bond for no other reason than to get back at Cubby Broccoli. And of course, the end result is never say never again. And I think Barbara Broccoli got it right when she said, Never say never again. I think prove the point that a Bond film cannot exist with just one element alone. Just having Sean wasn't enough. This is a rogue production, and as such, it didn't have the rights to the existing Bond elements, which would include the gun barrel, the James Bond theme, etc., etc. So what you get is an alternate universe James Bond film with a James Bond just shy of his twilight years. The end product is bizarre. It ranges from awkward to downright cringy. The attempts to prop up Connery as a virile James Bond is just cringe-inducing. Just how many women did they have to show smacking their lips, salivating over an aging James Bond? Okay, we get it, he's handsome. This meeting with Felix Leiter is also weird. Yes, get out. <laughs> Felix, not bad. Not bad at all. Nothing wrong with your reflexes. Like, who does that? Okay, so his reflexes are good. He's not too old to be in the field. Who are you trying to convince? As we said, the plot is a straight remake of Thunderball, so the plot's fine, but which film actually ages better? Never Say Never Again is firmly planted in the 80s. This went head to head in Octopussy in the same year, and I think Octopussy ages far better. And I think Thunderball ages far better. This one's got weird 80s fashions, the music is right out of the 80s. Even the gadgets, look at these gadgets. They're big, clunky, awkward. They don't have that sleek and sexy design that a classic James Bond gadget would. The cast is pretty much fine. Kim Basinger looks good. I mean, you know, she's fine. I think Klaus Maria Brandauer is interesting, but frankly, he's making Connery look older. And I know Barbara Carrera is chewing the scenery as Fatima Blush, but eh, it's a little over the top for me. I think the sets are also decent. I think they did go out of their way to sort of pump up the locations a little bit. But yeah, the supporting cast, I mean, they're just way over the top. I mean, we, I mean, seriously, Mr. Bean as Bond's contact. Johnny English, I'm here to see Pegasus. Still, no sense rushing things. I mean, the film just can't settle on a tone. And if you thought the underwater finale in Thunderball was boring, just wait till you get to the finale here. 
So yeah, I mean, I can't say much else about this film. It's got competent moments, but if this was your introduction to James Bond, I'm pretty sure you would not seek out another one. So this will be no surprise to anyone. When we reviewed this, I gave this a score of one. My least favorite Sean Connery film and my least favorite James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever. For me personally, what adds insult to injury with Diamonds Are Forever is that it came right after Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And this hot mess is meant to be an apology for Honor Majesty's. He's back. Good evening. And we're back to what great movies are all about. Hey, what the hell is this? One of the most epic, magnificent, perfect Bond films. For thee, the ships are drawn down to the waves. For thee, the market's throng with myriad slaves. Followed up with this cheap, schlocky mess of a movie. Keep leading on that tutor, Charlie, and you're gonna get a shot in the mouth. Now, not every Bond film has to be gritty and realistic and tough, etc. I know some can be over the top and fun and silly. That is the magic of the James Bond franchise, that it's sort of all over the map, and it's a good indicator, um, like a time capsule, if you will, for what movies were at the time. So I get it, it was meant to be fun and just kind of satisfying, but I mean, to me, this film is just strictly a comedy. I mean, the most emotion you get from watching this is you're either laughing or you're kind of going. Oh, that was cool. But I mean, nothing about this film is really meant to be logical, serious, or just good. I think most people already know that a big chunk of the budget went just to bring in Sean Connery again. So all of these things like the bad special effects, boring locations, and a particularly lame climax, a lot of it has to do with budget restraints and time constraints. So yeah, I mean, you can forgive some of it, but if you're just judging the final product, I'm sorry, but this is nothing but a shit show. A lot of the casting is really weird. I've never understood Wint and Kidd as bad guys. I know a lot of people like these guys, but I just I just find them to be so weird. Dr. Tynan sent us. Why didn't he come himself? He was taken sick, bitten by the bug. A lot of the plot is confusing because some of it ended up on the cutting room floor. Poor Lana Wood got cheated out of a much bigger part. And because of some weird edits, her ending up at the bottom of the pool makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I can never understand what the hell is happening. Like, what is up with the moon set? Seriously, Connery for some reason finds himself on a soundstage where they're faking the moon landing. What this has to do with the rest of the story, I have no idea. And then when Connery runs past the astronaut, the astronaut doesn't break character. Like, what the heck is that? The action is really weird. Every time I watch the moon buggy chase, I'm cracking up. Connery gets in this slow, clunky vehicle. He's chased by automobiles, which all they have to do is just follow behind him. But for some reason, they're driving erratically. They just flip over, flop over. And of course, the effects are terrible. The parts of the car just fall right off. The special effects are really unforgivable. I, I really don't know why they included these scenes. This Chinese base blows up. <laughs> The effect is laughably bad, and I don't know what it contributed to the story. This Russian sub blows up. Just check out Connery's entrance. I mean, listen to the music they play behind that. My name is Bond. James Bond. It's almost like John Barry knew this was meant to be funny. The clothes are weird. Don't get me started on the pink tie. I will say that every James Bond film has iconic moments. I do enjoy the Bambi and Thumper scene, even though it makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, James Bond has the whole CIA standing behind him, but he walks in by himself to get throttled by these two women. I mean, there is a good funny line or two. I tend to notice little things like that, whether a girl is a blonde or a brunette. And which do you prefer? Oh, providing the collars and cuffs match. But yeah, I mean, look, this is this is one of those films where I have to use the adage that all James Bond movies are like sex and pizza. When they're good, it's great. But even when it's bad, it's still good. So look, I mean, I mean, I could watch the film. I can sit in an audience and watch and eat popcorn and heckle. But I mean, as far as what I'm looking for in a James Bond film, this really has none of it. Welcome to hell, Blofeld. It's a film best known for its weirdness and not much else. Coming in at number five with a score of five, 
Uh, a solid entry for sure, but definitely probably one of the weirder ones. You only live twice. Welcome to Japan, Mr. Bond. Sort of like Diamonds Are Forever. I tend to put this one under a little extra scrutiny because it just came off the heels of what I consider to be the Fab Four. I mean, up until this point, the Bond films could do no wrong in my eyes. But as the films were getting bigger and bigger and they felt the pressure to make it more and more epic, this film goes full-blown science fiction. And yes, it is science fiction. I mean, we have rockets that can take off and then land vertically. Things we still don't have today. I mean, there are whole scenes that take place in space. In Doctor No, the villain's plot was to alter the course of rockets, but we saw it from the confines of Doctor No's lair. This film full-blown takes us into space. It's essentially Connery's Moonraker. Now, it's got its high points. John Barry is certainly on top of his game here. The film is pretty fun, and I would agree that it's also pretty self-aware. The film knows what it is. And I was lucky enough to catch this on the big screen in a re-release. And I gotta tell you, the ninja assault on the volcano lair on a really big screen, that's when you can really appreciate this movie for what it is. But with that said, I mean, it's a little awkward. I mean, Connery is the epitome of cool, and how silly does he look flying what looks like a toy airplane? I know that's a little sacrilegious, but I don't know. I just I always found this scene to be really weird. And even before Diamonds Are Forever, it had really awkward special effects. And I always felt it was really strange to kill off Aki in the middle of the film just to bring in Miyahama right before the finale. I mean, Miyahama is essentially the Bond girl of this film, but she barely speaks. You never hear her name. Think again, please. I mean, her name is lifted right from the book. She's Kissy Suzuki, but it's never mentioned. And I thought Aki was a much more interesting character. Although I've never understood Bond's elation when they meet up again. Aki. <laughs> I think the first time I saw this, I thought maybe this was someone who appeared in an earlier film. And of course, that kind of brings me around to... I mean, good lord, and this is such a chunk of the movie. And what's frustrating is that this part is right out of the book. I mean, when you read the novel, there's a big chunk where Bond adapts Japanese culture to blend in to go undercover. But in this film, it just feels so out of place. And of course, you've got... I am Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Yeah, now look, I know this was always going to be really tough to pull off. The buildup of Blofeld up until now was palpable. So you really need an actor who is going to pull off the presence that Blofeld needed. And I know Donald Pleasance is a fine actor, but giving him a big old ugly scar is not going to make him intimidating. But again, this is a film that has really iconic moments, Bond moments that you remember. And I think Scott would call this like a big old fun popcorn movie. And I would agree with that. So I think my score of five is pretty fitting. Now we're getting into the Fab Four, the Fab Four of Connery films. My fourth place entry, which some will probably find a little blasphemous, but I scored this one an eight, Goldfinger. I know having this so low on the list is probably pretty sacrilegious to many people. I mean, Goldfinger is the one that started the Bond phenomenon. We probably wouldn't have James Bond today if it wasn't for Goldfinger. So it's sort of a film that I feel like I should rate higher just out of a sense of gratitude. That probably also goes for the theme song by Shirley Basie. I mean, it's solid to say the least. And at this point, it's kind of cliche to talk about how iconic the film is and how many iconic moments it has. The DB5, the Golden Girl, Goldfinger's famous line. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. So yeah, it's a solid entry. I gave it an eight, but it's not really that high on my list because it's kind of lacking a lot of the things that I want in a James Bond movie. I mean, for me, the settings are really lackluster. Even a great setting like the Miami Hotel is really kind of underbind because everything is done in back projection. Bond scenes looks like it's shot on a set. I mean, this could have been spectacular and it's just a little clumsy. A lot of times I'll get into discussions about the great American Bond locations. I always forget Kentucky because it's so bland and forgettable. Like who cares? I mean, seriously, the film thought it was really cool that there was a place called Kentucky Fried Chicken and we spend so much time hanging around here. And that's another thing. Bond is really inactive for a lot of it. He's a passive player. It feels like halfway through the film, Bond gets captured and he more or less stays captured right up until the very end. Then of course you get the weird plot hole where Goldfinger tells his plot to all the gangsters only to kill them a few minutes later. I mean, it's an interesting moment when you're watching this for the first time and you're not really picking up on the plot hole. Okay, it works, but I think they just could have written it better. 
I mean, even a view to a kill gets this right. The cast is really good, although I always thought that Goldfinger was a really overrated villain. I mean, he's a chubby, schlubby guy, not exactly on par with James Bond, if you pardon the pun. And I have to say that I like that they improved upon the plot from the book. I mean, they flat out address the problems with the plot in the book and then approve upon it. And of course, what can you say about Honor Blackman as Pussy Galore? Smart, able, stunning to look at, truly one of the best Bond women of all time. I also love Shirley Eaton and Tanya Mallet in their respectable roles, really capturing the different personalities of both sisters. So yeah, it's really enjoyable. I like this film, I just don't love it. And again, I, I know it should be higher on my list because it's a classic, but yeah, there's just some other Conneries I like a lot better. My number three is gonna feel like a weird pick, uh, but it's kind of a favorite of mine and uh, has a lot of qualities that I really sort of connect with the early days of Fleming James Bond. Uh, with a score of eight, my third favorite, Dr. No. My name is Bond, James Bond. My instructions were implicit. I was to leave for Jamaica in two hours, licensed to kill. I know people are going to think I'm nuts that I actually put Dr. No above Goldfinger. But for some reason, I've always found this film to be really watchable. I think for one thing, I love the time that it's set. Meaning a lot of us have talked about how it would be great to go back and do the original Bond novels as period films. Well, Dr. No is already a period film. It is taking place in the time of Fleming. So I just really love that vintage feel. I mean, you have people who still dress for the occasion. The casino scene is classic. People are still smoking cigarettes. I mean, you just have Sean Connery's James Bond at his coolest. Everybody's cool in this movie, even Felix Leiter. It's still by far the coolest Leiter we've ever gotten, before Jeffrey Wright came along anyway. I love the location. I feel like anytime you have James Bond in the tropics, especially Jamaica, you know you're doing something right. And I love that James Bond is a detective. You see him using spycraft. That's something I think that got lost over the years, for a while anyway. And I think what impresses me most about this film is just how much they got right, just right out of the gate. I mean, this is the first movie, and there are definitely other tropes or part of the Bond formula that you wouldn't see for a couple years, but just look at how much they got right. Bond. James Bond. The gun barrel. The casting of Sean Connery as James Bond. The supporting cast, Money Penny M. Again, the great Felix Leiter. The rest of the cast is great. Quarrel is awesome. Joseph Wiseman is Dr. No. I mean, this guy would be the prototype for James Bond villains going forward. And maybe I just love the simplicity of it. It's Bond being sent on a mission to do some investigative work with some good espionage along the way until he gets his Bond girl and confronts the enemy. It just works. The top two Sean Connery films, uh, also with a score of eight, uh, which is kind of why these rankings are kind of fun, because I've got three films that I actually scored eight, but now I can kind of get into even more specific rankings with this. So this is the top of my three eights. This one is From Russia With Love. I gotta tell you, I've kind of rediscovered From Russia With Love in the last few years. For a long time, I would have put Dr. No on top of From Russia With Love on my list, and I couldn't really explain why, because for some reason From Russia With Love wasn't really grabbing me. I knew it was a lot of people's favorites, but for some reason I just couldn't really get my head around it. But I rewatched it not long ago, and suddenly I totally understood it. I think what I love about it is that it's badass Bond. I mean, this is classic James Bond at his best. He's at his toughest, he's cold, ruthless, but he's still looking like he's having a good time. A little more than in Dr. No. The dialogue is smart. I love the locations. Istanbul has become a classic Bond location. And I love that you get a look at a different culture. The gypsy fight is awesome. Not just because it's salacious and titillating, but I like that this is Bond observing an exotic culture. Now, I don't know how realistic it is, but it is exotic in a cinematic way. And of course, it erupts into a big explosive gunfight. I mean, this is great stuff. And again, you're talking about a classic setting. This is the time of Fleming. I mean, James Bond and Tatiana have to escape by train. Like, would you ever see that today? You get the introduction of Karen Bay, who is one of the greatest James Bond characters ever, I think. He's another one that soon became a prototype James Bond character. We would see variations on this relationship in several films going forward. And I also like the relationship between Bond and Tatiana. I mean, this is classic espionage. This is what was the stuff of spy stories. 
two people that are playing against each other, both with their own motives, both trying to get something. Bond can't tell where real feelings end and the espionage begins. Bond doesn't know who to trust. You got the incredible Red Grant. Again, I think one of the best Bond villains ever. This guy is scary. When this scene happens, you feel like if Bond doesn't get up off that floor, he's done for. And it's not going to be pretty. There's great buildup to Red Grant. You can see what he's capable of. You see what a physical specimen he is. And that fight on the train is classic. I think if the film has any flaws, it would be the pacing. I think that Bond defeating Grant feels like the climax of the film. And it just happens a little prematurely. But I also do like the boat chase. Or the boat confrontation. And it's a great story, too. I mean, it's one of the few cases where they stayed very faithful to the original novel. This is James Bond at his best and at his coolest. You could say you're a fan of From Russia With Love and you can hold your head high. This film deserves respect. And my favorite, Sean Connery, James Bond film of all time. And there's a lot of great ones to choose from, that's for sure. But this one for me just has everything I want in a James Bond film. I scored it a 9 at the time, and uh, it is my top favorite Sean Connery James Bond film, Thunderball. Again, I know some people will think I'm a little nutty to have this on the top of my list. I know a lot of people don't really care for it, and a lot of people think it's a little boring. But for me, this one just has everything. It's all the ingredients of a great Bond film. I think one of the first things that grabbed me about this film was its location. I think I fell in love with the Bahamas literally from the first time I saw this film. It was instantly on my bucket list and I'm really happy to say that I've since been there several times. Terrence Young is back in the director's chair and I think you can feel his presence. Remember I talked about the scene at the Miami Hotel that looked kind of clunky? You'll never see that in Thunderball. They take such great advantage of the wonderful locations. Every frame of this film, I'm thinking I want to go there. I mean, first off, the plot is spectacular. I mean, what can you say about this plot? It is a classic Bond plot. And frankly, it works. This is the film that really upped the stakes. I mean, this is the first plot where James Bond saves the world, but yet the scale of the film stays pretty grounded. The film itself doesn't have to go to over-the-top heights to convey the idea that this is serious business. You're also getting that classic trope where Bond is going head-to-head -head with the bad guy. The one-upsmanship is clearly on display, and I find that I buy it here much more than I did in Goldfinger. I think Adolfo Celli's Emilio Largo is a great character. Not perfect. Some would say that he's just Goldfinger with an exotic accent and an eye patch, but I think that would be undervaluing an exotic accent and an eye patch. I think they took the classic archetype and brought him up to what to me seems more like a James Bond style villain. I love the casino scene and I love Bond at Palmyra. And, by the way, the relationship between Bond and Domino is classic espionage. Once again, James Bond is called upon to charm and seduce a woman to get her to help him to solve the crime. And boy do I love when Bond and Domino meet underwater. Now that's an improvement over the novel. In the novel, Bond just approaches Domino on the streets of Nassau and they have a drink. The fact that they actually meet underwater, the fact that we're, as the viewer, arriving in the Bahamas already underwater, and the two of them meeting for the first time underwater, to me is absolutely amazing. I think it's a really underrated moment. And I also like the climax of the film. And I know a lot of people don't because they say it's a little slow, but I thought it was great. Again, I find something really exotic about action taking place underwater. If the film has one clunky element, it's probably this guy. Look, the bomb cannot be exploded now. I threw the arming device into the seat, do you understand? So basically, he saved the day off screen while Bond was off doing something else. Who's he? I don't know, but he helped me. In the big scheme of things, maybe he should have run off with Domino at the end. But again, classic location, classic style, an elegant film, a smart film. I know this is my personal humble opinion, but Thunderball is everything I could want in a James Bond film. So there you go, my uh, seven Sean Connery films ranked, six official films, one unofficial film, but I figured I guess we gotta throw it in here anyway. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my list. If you disagree, if you think I'm so totally full of it, comment below. Let me know how you would rank the Sean Connery films. Uh, thank you for watching. Please subscribe to Being James Bond if you haven't already. Share this with your friends. Tell everyone who loves James Bond you need to see the Being James Bond channel. Uh, Scott and I will be back. We're going to be back ranking the Roger Moore films. 
But we will uh, see you next time. Take care. And as always, keep living like James Bond.